Jai Quad NVMe RAID enclosure. And we would like to thank Jai for making this video possible. If you need external storage, this Thunderbolt enclosure is a build your own RAID solution. Welcome everyone. This is going to be an unboxing, an inspection, an installation, and a test. Test is actually going to be five tests, possibly six, because we're going to have four drives. So we're going to test those four drives individually, and then we're going to test those drives collectively in a RAID. The unboxing. Jai has asked us to take a look at this device because they like to know what we think of it. And of the three things that Thunderbolt can do, data being one of them, either data storage like this or for a DAW, when you have a digital audio interface, this is my favorite. Brown box. We expect to see five components in here. One, a USB-C cable for Thunderbolt power delivery. Two, a USB-C cable for Thunderbolt data delivery. Oh, I see a screwdriver. That may make component number six. We also have thermal pad, plural. We have the power tap for power delivery, GII. We have a um, certificate sheet with a code that you can read with your smartphone for more information and the device. And with this device, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's six components. With this device, there's actually three components. One, the interface, two, the connections, and then three, the bridge chip. And on the back, we have another name for the device called Thunder Rate. And we may see that in future marketing. Don't know. This is a uh, revision one of the device. The bridge chip that I'm most curious about, we don't know that's supposed to be a secret. And I'm curious, but not curious enough to disassemble it and find out. Let's look around. I like, uh, I like the feel of this. Now, it's too big to stick it. Well, I take that back. I can stick this in a shirt pocket. But it's uh, bigger than a smartphone as far as the width. But you could put it in a shirt pocket if you had to. But it's a, it's a nice chunk of aluminum this is machined out of. It's got rubberized feet on the back. You can see here. We've got four screws to remove. Looking at the connections. The interface here at the indentation is probably for power. We're going to double check. And this interface is probably for data. And spinning this around, it's got air holes so it can breathe. On the back side, that's just machined aluminum indentations. And it looks like there's holes here. That may be for LEDs. We're going to find out. And coming on around to the other side, it looks like two more open slots. I don't know what those are for. So we need to open this up, take these screws off, see what we've got. And the thermal pads are individual pads. A device like this, I would have expected something more uh, conventional, like one large pad that's already mounted. But these we get to mount ourselves. And it looks like there's four there. But we're going to have ten questions we're going to also answer. Now I'm going to glove up when I start handling M.2 NVMe drives to protect against uh, ESD. But for right now, I'm just handling this device. I'm okay with it like it is. We'll get the four screws out. There's either a bit of pressure or this back is a little bit warped. It looks like it's a little bit warped. And if that's intentional, that's meant to increase pressure on the drives. I've got one screw left to take out. Just wanted to point that out in case anybody else notices. And my expectation, the PCB on this will probably be uh, concealed. It has the chip we're looking for. Okay, the lid, machined aluminum, flat. And this lid has an edge on it, but this has been machined. That's a machined lip. So that's a lot of work for that. And I'm really curious about the bridge chip. But yeah, based on the way this is laid out, once the lid is removed, if you'll notice, those four screw holes, then the other screws that hold the PCB and the rest of this chassis together, which is two parts, as you can see here from the line, would have to be taken apart to flip that over so that we could look at it and examine the PCB. Not going to do that. We just want to keep this simple, make this thing work, because the tests are going to take a little bit of time. Installing the drives are going to take a little bit of time. And the screws for the M.2 drives happen to be in the bag with the thermal pads. I'm okay with that. I keep the drives on a quad card. These drives have been used so many times. So that's something else we're going to have to deal with once we get into Windows. I don't remember the status of the drives. In other words, uh, to reiterate, I do not remember if they are in RAID or out of RAID. So we'll deal with that when we get to it. But they're not new drives. These are Sabrent drives, two terabytes. So question number one, how big of a drive will this take? Based on the bridge chip, up to eight terabytes. I'll get more into the specs on these drives once we get them all installed. And yes, because these are Sabrent, these are double-sided. And there are no pads on here. We're just going right to the PCB. 
Okay, four drives, all we gotta do now is put down the screws. Something else we should point out while I'm thinking of it. Now this is designed for the 2280 only. And I've removed this drive to show you. There are no screw holes to allow for an adjustment of these bushings that are up here. So 2280 is the only size this will take. And on the width, this will be PCI Express 3 or PCI Express 4. Based on what we've seen on the research we've done, the PCI Express 5 is going to be a little bit wider. So even though the uh, interface would be backwards compatible, the width of the drives will not be because they are a little bit wider than this. So to reiterate, PCI Express 3 or PCI Express 4, 2280 only. Now we got to do, get our four screws in, set our thermal pads. The micro screwdriver that's included is perfect for this. However, it is not magnetic and putting those screws in without losing them is a little bit of a, uh, an issue. So I happen to be using a screwdriver of the same type variety that is magnetized because I could easily see losing one of those screws down in that ridge and then having to take the whole thing apart to chase it out. Not interested. All four screws set and looks like we have four extra screws. Nice. I appreciate that. Those screws are so tiny it would be easy to drop one and if you dropped it it's gone forever. Down into the carpet or whatever on the floor. So I appreciate that. And there are four thermal pads. These look like they are one millimeter thick. Let's check. And this says 0 0.8 and I still have the covers on both sides. The film that protects them. They are uh, silicone thermal pads. So they might be more like 0 0.7. But this says 0 0.8. Checking our length. They look to be appropriately sized. And no, we are not taking the labels off these drives. That's a metallic label. If you choose to do so, as we have uh, reiterated in the past, that's your choice. We test far too many devices to take labels off trying to figure out who's on first. None of these installations that we show you are permanent. This is strictly to show you how this stuff works. And I've been eager to check this one out. And the pads have a little bit of a tack to them, a little bit of a stickiness. And I'm going to position them closer to the uh, connector end. And these are the kind of pads that apparently are made up of squares. So for those of you that want to position accordingly, I like a full thermal pad to cover the whole thing because I like an even pressure on compression. That's just me. Oh, as I look at this now, I can see the squares in here. And I also, uh, because these are squares, these are one-time pads. If you've ever uh, messed with pads, when you go to try to pull them up, especially these squares, I think that'd be a mess. They're just a little bit over on the width as they go side to side, which is interesting. But I'm not going to trim the width because I think I'd have a mess if I did. And there should be just enough space in there for those to drop down. Yeah, they will. Now when we test the drives individually, we'll be able to check for heat. But when we test the drives collectively in RAID, we will not. I'll get a little more into that when we get to that point. As well as the spec on the drive. And I'm sure if we wanted to improve the thermal conductivity of these pads, then of course we would want to uh, change out the thermal pads. So I don't expect these to survive intact, being used and moved around a lot. In other words, if we change drives for any reason. Had good luck with the first two. This third one's giving me a little bit of a grief. And of course it had to walk a little bit, not the direction I need it. I would have thought for a device like this, they would have had one large thermal pad instead of these uh, individual. Strips are again to reorder my preference. I'm not fond of these little squares, and I understand why a lot of people use them. Since they tend to walk, I'll pull these from the connector side, see if we have better luck. And that one came off perfect. And where those pads overlap, they'll drop right down in between. I am not cutting. And we'll store the protective covers in with the extra screws. You never know, you might need them. Okay, we'll set that aside. It's interesting to note the thickness of the uh, aluminum to dissipate heat is the thin piece of aluminum on the back and not the thick piece which is part of the housing, the casing. So uh, to dissipate heat through the thermal pads to this, I question how well that's going to work when the body of this aluminum is the other direction but I don't know what's on the other side which would imply that they're ex expecting heat to be dissipated through the connector and uh, through the fastener that holds the uh, M.2 drive down, but that's just my observation. Yeah, looks like that's made with a little bit of a bow to help with compression. Okay, lid is down secured. You can see there where that's got a little bit of a give in it. 
we just got to get these four corners attached. Then we can go to the next step. And the four screws that hold the shell together, in other words, clamp that back on, they don't respond to a magnetic screwdriver. And that is a mighty short Thunderbolt cable for data that they've included, but I understand why. What I'm curious is to see what kind of numbers we get. Okay, the Jii Thunder Rate for NVMe storage device is now complete. So what we need to do is plug this in and see how it's going to work. So this is the top, this is the bottom, and in the bottom is where we put the four drives. So that means the four drives that are facing up, when we turn this over, the four drives will now be facing down, as if the heat is going to dissipate down through the bottom, whereas the heat really should be dissipating up through the top. That's just my way of thinking about it, but uh, nobody asked me. I'm just sharing with you my thoughts. So now we need to get out the power adapter. Nice long cable. That looks like about four feet long. Very nice. And the data cable looks like about uh, 14 inches long. Just a rough guess. And if there's any question in the difference in the cables, USB-C, you notice the data cable has the Thunderbolt insignia and three, both ends labeled accordingly, to power. Now we will plug in the data cable to the GI, and these four lights we should see light up on the enclosure right here once we have activity. The problem is going to be turning it around and showing it to you with this end plugged in. Power, data. Yep, there we go. One device light. I don't know if you can see that. That one device light is bright blue, and then we have four green LEDs for each one of the drives. So we should be good to go. It looks more like a white light on the camera, but as I look at it, it's a bright blue. And the next cable is going to be for data, which will be the one on top. Now the tricky part is how we're going to plug this in, because uh, even though this is Thunderbolt 3, this should also be USB-C compliant, but I don't know that for a fact if we can plug it into USB-C and see anything, or if it'll be at reduced speed. So what we want to do is we're going to use the Gigabyte TRX40 designator here in front of me, and I'm going to put another camera on here and show you as I plug this in, because as the computer boots up, I'd kind of like to go into the BIOS and see if anything else is enumerated for the device that uh, we wouldn't see unless the device is connected. I don't know, but I want to find out. So uh, another camera, and I can take this off. Okay, that's a pretty good indication of the Thunderbolt 3 card. So we're going to plug that into the Thunderbolt 3. We'll go to port number 1. Now we need to power up. We're going to go into the BIOS, see what we can see. Energize. Now once we hear a post, let's go look at the BIOS. Settings, I.O. ports, and we'll skip down here to Thunderbolt configuration. Thunderbolt support enabled, no security. And two memory allocations, one for per port, megabytes, 256. And then memory allocated per port, again, 256. I expected to see something else in here available, but there's not. That's pretty simple. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and reboot the computer. We'll go into Windows, and we should see device connectivity. Uh, one other thing we might look at is see if these drives are seen from boot. That might tell us something. So we'll go to boot. Isn't that interesting? One, two, three, and four which means those four drives are seen from boot, which means we could boot from one drive, but we could not do a RAID unless we did a hardware RAID. And uh, this brings up another question, which is the 10 I'll go through in a minute, but as I'm, as I'm here, because I'm at the BIOS, this only supports RAID or JBOD, and the only RAID it supports is a software RAID. If we can figure that in the BIOS for those four drives, that theoretically means that would support a hardware RAID. But if we did that, we couldn't put it to another machine unless the other machine had all the same support, which I'll reiterate all that again when I go through the 10. Uh, that's fascinating. That's curious. And that's worth looking into. But that's not what we're going to do right now. Our goal is to get this up and running, to test it, see what we think of it so far. But uh, if there's a version 2 of this, or if we take another look at it, depending on the kind of uh, questions you guys ask, that might be something to look at, but that's promising. F10, no changes. We're going to say save the configuration. Yes. Computer will reboot. We go through post, straight to Windows. First thing I'm going to do is Windows flag E. Let's take a look at this PC. And no, we don't see the drives. Okay. So what we want to do is go to Control Panel. We're going to go to Administrative Tools. And we're going to go to uh, Computer Management and then Disk Management. Yep, right there, Disk Management. We don't see the drives, so this is a Thunderbolt device. We want to bring up the uh, Thunderbolt control panel. 
Shows a device name OEM Thunderbolt 3, M.2 bridge, connection status connected, vendor OEM. They'll want to fix that later. So we are on port 1. No approval needed. Devices will automatically connect. Thunderbolt 3, M.2 bridge. And if we were to disconnect, that would disconnect. So I'll connect it back up again. Device comes back. It's interesting. It saw temporarily or momentarily, it saw one drive, but it didn't see all four drives. Now the four drives that are currently in here are Sabrent two terabyte drives. So two times four, two, four, six, eight. We should be able to take that, combine that for eight terabytes. And to reiterate, question number one, how big will this support? Eight terabyte drives. We don't know about the bridge chip. I'll get more to that in a minute. And I'm going to reiterate all this again. But uh, I want to emphasize the point right now that we saw one drive. It came up, went away, but it doesn't see the other drives, which I'm kind of curious why. So uh, something funny is going on. Could be me, could be user, could be something with the device, don't know yet. But I'm going to unplug it again. Let's watch the screen. We'll see what happens. And I'll go to port 2 this time. Going to unplug it. So we have a connectivity issue. There's that one disk again. And I've just disconnected. Now I'm going to go to port 2 and see what happens. So I had a loose connection with a cable. I'll bring up the Thunderbolt control panel. Sees it on port 2. I'm going to unplug it from the card again. So I brought up the secondary screen. And you can see what's going on. We have Thunderbolt connectivity, and over here, if I can get this where we can see it, the drives went away. So I'm going to unplug that cable again, go back to port 1, plug that in, let's see if the drive comes back. Thunderbolt sees it with the chipset, and the only connection I messed with is the connection on the Thunderbolt card. I have not messed with the connection on the back of the device. Ah, we can see there's some green LEDs inside, and this is apparently to let it breathe for the PCB. I can't pull this up too far to get it off camera. So there's an LED here toward the back that's only seen from here. And another LED you can barely see through here that lights all this up. Curious. Okay, so to reiterate, I haven't messed with this connection, but this was the connection I fiddled with on the Thunderbolt card. So I'm, I'm wondering about if maybe we have a problem with the uh, Thunderbolt cable. I don't know. It's a brand new cable. came with a device. I'm going to unplug it one more time. In fact, I'll unplug it from both ends. Plus swap. Plug in the device first, nice click, and we'll plug into the uh, card. What we may have to do is try a different cable. Okay, I pulled the cable off, flipped it around. I show I get device connectivity, but I think there's an issue with the cable. That's where I think the problem is. I don't know if there's a bad connection in the cable. I just happen to have another cable by StarTech. We'll try this cable, and this is one meter or three feet. And it's rated for Thunderbolt 3 40 gigabit USB-C. Let's see if that makes a difference. Now this is a brand new cable that's never been used. So this will, uh, this should be interesting. Oh yeah, this is a longer cable and a heavier cable. In fact, the weight of this cable is more like, uh, it looks a lot like the cable that came with it, but it's more like the, uh, heavier like the power cable, just a little bit heavier. So we're going to unplug. Ah, the drive came back. Let me show you right quick. Look at that. Now that's strange. Took a while to enumerate. There's disc 1, disc 2, disc 3, and disc 4. So maybe I was not waiting long enough. So we'll set the cable aside. I don't know if it's an issue with the bridge chip or the technology. I don't know. But it's something to be aware of. So what we want to do is now that we know, we can see all four drives. And I, again, to reiterate, I didn't know what status they were in. Because we can see them and we know that we are plugged in to the primary Thunderbolt port, of which there are two. I'll take that off. We may just need to wait. So anyway, to reiterate, we see all four drives. They show that they're healthy. Let's go to Windows Flag E and see this PC. Okay, doesn't see them. So the operating system sees the hardware, but the operating system does not see the partition. Okay, now that we see the four drives, we're going to go through all four of these. New simple volume. This is disk one. Next, be drive letter D by default. And we're going to call this first Thunderbolt. Next, and when we say finish, a drive letter pops up. Interesting. Just a little bit slower than if the drives were uh, directly connected, but still adequate. So we'll go to disk number two, delete the volume. Apparently these drives were in a RAID. Stands to reason on a quad card. So a simple volume on all four of these. Second Thunderbolt. Next, finish. Drive letter pops up. Close that. We'll go to disk number three, delete the volume. Are you sure you want to do this? Yes. And for those wondering, this selected partition was not created by Windows and might contain data. Yeah, it was an array to reiterate. So yes, all in the name of research. New simple volume. Next, full capacity. Another drive letter. And we're going to give this one third Thunderbolt. Next, finish. 
To reiterate, drive letter pops up. We'll scroll on down the list for number four. Delete volume. Yes. Oh, wow. It says that one's currently in use. Yeah, we're going to force it. Okay. Now, to reiterate, new simple volume. Fourth time's a charm. Next, next. Full capacity, another drive letter. And this one gets fourth volume. Fourth Thunderbolt. And then when we say next, yes, finish, another drive letter pops up. Now we can close that. Now, because in disk management, we've done four drive letters. When we bring up the Windows flag E and go over here to this PC, then we will see those drive letters appear, of which they're all usable. So we have four drives that we can test. So apparently when I started running this, I think the uh, order of the day was uh, patience, persistence, and perseverance. But number one, patience. Just wait till the whole thing enumerates and comes online. That was the issue. We're used to everything happening fast. Okay, to reiterate, we have four drives, so we want to test all four of those drives because one of the questions as I go through an outline as I come back around with this is as we test the four drives, we can do heat and speed. Because the information from Smart passes through, we're able to see how that's going to work. So I'm going to put the two applications up on screen. So while we're testing heat, we'll test speed, and we'll see what we get on the numbers based on how that case is designed, how it works. Then the last test we can test with uh, those four drives in RAID as one drive, we'll only be able to test the speed. Now, based on the technology, I think our limit, because the drives are mapped, and that's another question that will come up as I go through this, I've got to keep referring back to that, but I want to talk about this as it makes sense. Each drive is mapped one drive to one lane, so one PCI Express lane to reiterate one drive. So how many drives can you use in RAID? You don't have to have four. You can have one, two, three, or four drives working in this case, but how many drives does it take for RAID? Two drives or more. So if you want to do RAID and you want to gain the increase in speed of that one lane to two lanes to three lanes to four lanes, four drives, four lanes, you get the increase. Now, our expectation based on speed in RAID uh, when we put four drives in RAID on a quad card, it's the equivalent of three drives. So because these are PCI Express 4.0, I think first generation, which is around 5,000 megabytes, we would not get four times five, which would be 20,000. We would get uh, three times five, which would be 15,000. So per drive, 5,000 per drive. Now, the limiting factor on that is going to be that one PCI Express lane, because remember, even though we're talking 40 gigabit for Thunderbolt 3, Thunderbolt 4, and Thunderbolt 4 is bi-directional, we have to remember the technology PCI Express 3 is what's required for Thunderbolt 3 or 4. And because PCI Express 3 has a bandwidth of around 31, uh, we're only going to see 31 gigabit. We're only going to see about 1,000 megabytes per lane. That's my expectation. If we top out at that, great. But I don't see us going beyond that. So... Let's do that test, see what each drive comes out to. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. So we just have to remember our labels. The only drive we won't test will be drive C. So we can close all this information out. We don't need to see all that anymore. And I'm sure Jai want to, will want to reiterate, have that label customized later to uh, indicate them who they are. So the first thing we want is hardware info, sensors only. We'll put that test up on the left. Okay, the Seagate Fire Cuda, that's the boot drive. And here are our four drives, which are Sabrent, which will be one, two, three, and four. Now, I'm not sure which drive is which, but when we start running the test, we'll figure it out pretty quick. So we're going to bring up Crystal Disk Mark, put that on the side, and then we'll highlight whichever one starts showing a rise in temperature. Right now, we're looking at uh, 38, 39, 39, and 40 degrees. So the first drive we'll test will be drive D. It's a two terabyte drive, so we want to do a two gigabyte test file all. And on the temps, we're looking at the minimum, maximum, and average. And test for drive number one is complete, and it looks like the drive at the top is probably uh, the sequential order. We won't know until we run the next test and get all through these. So to reiterate, I was in hopes we get something around 1,000 megabytes, uh, but you got to allow for overhead, so anything between 750 and 1,000 would be adequate. That one drive, which is one drive to one lane, 835. That's not an issue with the drive. That's not an issue with the uh, GII enclosure. That's just the technology one PCI Express lane. And once we do these four tests, reiterate, we'll then complete that by putting all four of them in a RAID and then testing those four in RAID, and we should see something like we've talked about. So that's drive number one. Let's go to drive number two, which is F, two terabyte, two gigabyte, and all. And let's see if we can do any better than 835 or 614. All these should come in around the same. 
will highlight. I expect that to be drive number two, but I don't know that for a fact. And for those wondering about the versions of the software we're using, that's to uh, keep it apples and apples with the other tests we've been doing. But we will in the future cut all that off, update everything, and start new. But right now, as a continuation, apples and apples. Test number two is complete. And as we look at the maximum and the minimum on the temps, 4238, 4339. And our, uh, we're not measuring IOPS, but we're just looking at the basics. Megabytes on the read and megabytes on the write. Coming in pretty close. Let's go now to drive number three. Again, two terabytes, two gigabytes. Highlighting drive three, all. Test number three is complete. That looks good. Numbers are consistent. And we are at a maximum of 44 and uh, 39 for the minimum. Now let's test drive number four, two terabyte, two gigabyte. All, highlight. And test number four is complete. We are at a maximum of 46 degrees and a minimum of 39. So all four of the drives have come in pretty consistently on their minimum from 38 to 39. And we've been from 42, 43 in the last drive, 46. Another question that arises would be about heat. Because remember, the drives are on the bottom. Now to touch this, I'm taking the gloves off. To touch this, it's warm to the touch, but really right here, like testing milk, I can put my wrist to it. It'd be too hot for baby's milk, but I can put my wrist to it okay, it's fine. Now remember, the drives are on the bottom, and they dissipate that way with the pads. It actually feels hotter on top than it does on the bottom. That's curious. So I think the heat sink is doing a pretty good job. I like the temps because we are within acceptable parameters. I don't see an issue with that. But to reiterate, we could in increase that capability with different thermal pads. However, that shield on the bottom is super thin. I don't know how much good you're going to do because the ability of those pads to move heat away, there's got to be something down there to move it from. And all we're doing is putting the heat into whatever surface we're sitting on. So I don't think it's worth changing out the thermal pads. My biggest concern was the cable. And I don't know if that was uh, the cable or if it was me not waiting long enough. We saw one drive, but we didn't see all four drives. So I'm a little on the fence about that. I'm going to have to spend some more time with it. Okay, where we're at right now, we've done four tests, each drives individually. The question is, based on the speeds we've got, let's take, destroy that, put those all four of those drives in one RAID, test that again. And just for round numbers, let's say uh, 835 times 4, which would actually be about 835 times 3. That's what I would expect for the speed, which would be, to reiterate, 835 megabytes times 3. So let's see. We'll close these out. Disk management, so we'll go to computer management, disk management, and we'll remove the configuration for these drives individually so that we can create a RAID with all four collectively. Delete the volume, delete the volume, delete the volume, and delete the volume. Now we'll go back, and this time we're going to do RAID 0 by the seat of our pan. So we're going to do a striped volume, run the wizard, two or more disks, one disk is selected, so we're going to add all these others, three and four. So we have four disks that we'll now create a RAID of that capacity, 2468. Drive letter D, next, and this will be new RAID volume. We're going to do a quick format, otherwise we'd be here all day. Next, and finish. The operation you selected will convert the selected basic disks to dynamic disks. If you convert the disk to dynamic, you will not be able to start installed operating systems from any volume on the disk, except the current boot volume. Are you sure you want to continue? Yes. And then when finished, a drive letter should pop up, which it did, and that we can test. Now that will not be seen. Let's close all that out. Windows flag E. Let's go to this PC. And there's our new RAID volume. Okay, to reiterate, this is a software RAID. The technology for software RAID, Windows is supposed to be able to uh, pass uh, smart through that to see the individual drives for trim. That's one of the questions we're going to have. Now, this question about trim support, I've seen conflicting information. Um, according to the, uh, I've read some places where trim will support on the RAID for an M.2 NVMe, and I've read where it will not. We're going to run a command and see what's enabled, because Windows, by default on Windows 10, will enable trim on an individual M.2 NVMe drive. Uh, for drives in RAID, I don't know. Let's see. Okay, we have two ways we're going to check trim. One, we're going to check it from a command prompt, and two, there's an application. Now, the application I'm going to show you, I'm only doing this because it may come up separate from the device, but since we're here, we've had this question about trim. 
Anyway, to reiterate, the application I'm going to show you will show you the capability of the device, which is the drive within this container. That's not necessarily meaning that the capability is enabled. But I want to show you anyway, because if I don't, someone's going to ask. So the first thing we want to do is bring up a command. We'll right click, run as administrator. I'll take this full screen. I'm going to key in a command. And without a switch, this command, once I type this in, and I'll put a link to this information in the description, press enter. This command only gives us basic information. I'll bring it up fairly large so we can read it. Now this is telling us what the C drive is doing. Reverse of an idea, but if that had uh, one, that would mean it would not be enabled. Because it has zero on it, to reiterate, that means trim is enabled. There's another command we're going to type that will be more uh, inclusive. Now this command, notice the first command was fsutil space behavior space query, and then the space disable delete notify. Okay, this time we're going to do fsutil space fsinfo space sector info. Then we're going to specify the drive. If we don't, we'll get the default, which would be C. And that tells us, as I scroll down, right here that trim is supported. Now what we want to know is the other drive. So Windows flag E, this PC, what we want to know is the new RAID volume, which is drive D. So we'll tab back over, key in the command again, and this time space... D colon enter and this will tell us what we want to know which is trim is not supported so I'm still going to show the application that will give the information but yet not uh, tell you if it's enabled this is the details on being enabled or not and not being supported so I think we need to follow the structure if you have a hybrid BIOS bootable RAID which is something that occurs within a BIOS then uh, that goes two ways. If you have an AMD hybrid BIOS bootable RAID, which this is not, we think it might support it, but we don't know. RAID is not supported for trim. If, however, you have an Intel RST hybrid BIOS bootable RAID, trim is supported under RAID 0, RAID 0 only. But this is a software RAID, and this is what's recommended. And this should, to reiterate, still be portable. So if anything else comes up about trim, I hope this kind of... Uh, solves and alleviates that question. Proof is in the doing, but sometimes we have to uh, find this stuff out. I didn't know this till now. The question has come up before, and um, to reiterate, trim is enabled by default on a drive, but getting trim on uh, a RAID situation. Now, if this were a hardware RAID, depending on the hardware controller being used, trim is probably going to be uh, enabled but I don't know that for a fact again when we get to that point we'll do some testing and find out everything with NVMe especially with this uh, RAID stuff because remember RAID came with us from SCSI RAID's been around a long time NVMe is pretty new so a lot of this stuff is just getting up to speed we all want it we all want all the features but we want it all right now AMD still got some work to do Intel does too but they've got it on RAID 0 on the Intel RST so let's get back to the other stuff that we're working on and follow on with the rest of our questions. And there's going to be some more reiterations. Hope this helps. And before we do that, let's check that application. We're going to bring up Crystal Disk Info and we're going to run the 64-bit version. And that shows us, if you'll notice, we're on the Seagate Fire CUDA and right here it says Features, Trim. Yes, that is correct. Now, up here on the top left, I'll tab over to one of the Sabrent drives, which it can see, and it says that is a feature. That feature does not mean that's enabled. And if I were to scroll through on the other three drives, so that's number one, number two, number three, and number four. And there's a serial number on each drive, PCI Express 3 and PCI Express 4. So that's kind of a side note, but it's going to come up. It's come up in the past. We've covered it. I hope that'll take care of it for now. And to reiterate, I'll have those links in the description so you'll know what those commands are to type so you can check. But remember, you want to check the drive letter, not just the command, which would by default be the C drive. And since we are in RAID, we'll close all that out from uh, computer management, disk management. One quick thing we want to look at is the control panel for the uh, Sabrent. So let's check the rocket control panel. And no, it does not see the drive up here in the top left. Oh, I take that back, it does. It sees the Sabrent drives. So smart technology is passed. Outstanding. So we see drive one, drive two,
drive three and drive four and temperature is consistent with what we saw so now let's close that out and close that out let's bring up hardware info sensors only and let's see if we can see that raid or those individual drives I didn't expect to but we do can't do that with a hardware raid but we can with a software raid let me rephrase that there's three types of raid typically we're, we're um, aware of that we're used to a uh, hybrid BIOS bootable raid which is the BIOS then you've got the operating system raid which is what we're doing software raid and you got a hardware raid hardware raid requires a hardware card we've got a separate video about that those are all CPU based then there's a GPU based and what I'm curious about is because this is a uh, operating system RAID, we're able to pass that material forth so we have some uh, semblance of what the drive is doing. In other words, in this software RAID, we're able to one, get trim, which is one of the questions I'll go through in a minute. I'm making this conversational from my perspective because I'm seeing this for the first time and I'm curious about a lot of things about this device. What do I think of it? So far I'm impressed. But, but to reiterate, remember this is, uh, they claim not a hardware RAID, but based on what we saw in the beginning, this should support hardware RAID. The concern is, if you set this up for hardware RAID and you take that to another machine, because we're on Thunderbolt, that other machine has to have everything configured exactly the same. In other words, it's got to have the same kind of information in the BIOS so that it would see the hardware RAID, otherwise it's not going to work. It's a lot simpler to move a software RAID than it would be to move a hardware RAID, because the hardware RAID you need the card that does the RAID. Whereas in this case, it's a hybrid BIOS bootable RAID, so it's not a full software RAID. So it gets a little complicated. So in other words, keep it simple, make it work. Software RAID can be JBOD, four drives, or with RAID with one drive. We're now able to see the heat, which I didn't expect. So I want to test that and see how these four drives come out with speed. So far, so good. I'm impressed. So we'll see how this works. Crystal disk mark. So I want to test all four of these again. But, as you see, there's the difference. We're only going to test one drive. That's what Windows will see. So what we're going to look at over here on the left, we'll just have to watch these four drives and see how they uh, perform according to heat. From what we saw in the first set of tests, the last drive ran the hottest. So I'll highlight the first drive. We're going to go back over here to drive D, which is now 2468. So if that's 8 terabytes, we need an 8 gigabyte test file all and I'll highlight and let's watch our minimum and our maximum temperatures I expect that fourth drive right there to be the hottest we'll see and test number four complete and yeah it looks like our hottest temperature was on the last two drives uh, not too bad 46 degrees still all very much well within acceptable parameters now I was going to unplug this and I should have done that to test it on USB-C but this is specified as a Thunderbolt device. So I'm concerned, I'm curious, but I'm concerned if I unplug it and put it on USB-C, what we would see. I know we'll have reduced speed. I don't need to test for that. We're looking at this for maximum performance. Now my suggestion, so I've got 10 questions we're going to go through. Uh, I would use this to transport data. I don't know that I would use this as a working drive. The problems we had in the beginning with the connection, I think were more about my patience than about with the cable, but that was my number one concern. The device, heat, I could touch it and it's still hot. Too hot for baby's milk, but not too hot for me to touch with the back of my wrist. And again, to reiterate, drives on the bottom, thermal pads, so it's trying to push heat out the bottom, but I feel heat on the top. The lights on the front stay on, they don't blink. One for the device, and then uh, four more lights, total of five. The four green lights, one blue light always on. The questions. Capacity. 8 terabytes for drive. That's the biggest drive out. Again to reiterate, since we don't know the uh, bridge chip, that's the brains of the thing, we don't know how that's set up, what the capabilities or the specs are. In other words, when, when a 16 terabyte drive comes out, will this support it? I don't know. It should, but I don't know the bridge chip. So to reiterate, right now, you could put in four 8 terabyte drives. Um, and another question is going to come up that's not part of this. Okay, what drives do you recommend to buy for this? I would get the drives that give you the capacity and the speed you want. You've seen the speed, PCI Express 3 versus PCI Express 4. We're not going to get the speed of the drives, but the more uh, advanced drives that run faster because they're newer are probably going to be less expensive. 
Whereas if you try to buy a PCI Express 3 drive, it may be more expensive, not in as much demand, not as much supply. So you have to look at, you know, price performance. To reiterate, get the drive that's the best bang for the buck. And these happen to be two terabyte drives because that's what we had. A first generation capable of 5,000 megabytes. So you see the speed we're getting. Now, of course, in RAID, these numbers, we're looking at just under uh, 3,000, which is good. Because that means 2884, which would mean for PCI Express 3.0, which is capable of around 3,000 to 3,500 megabytes, we're getting 2885 on the read. The write is uh, terrible, but I don't think that's uh, the issue with the drive, and I don't think it's an issue with the uh, interface. It could be the bridge chip, or it could be the Windows Software RAID. I don't know. But uh, the 28, my, to reiterate, my experience, my expectation for 2884 with the overhead, of which we should be able to be capable of around for one drive, 3,000 to 3,500 megabytes if it had four lanes on PCI Express 3, which is what Thunderbolt 3 and Thunderbolt 4 are based on, those are pretty good numbers because uh, we're doing better than I expected. That's my point. So the speed of 3, that's good numbers. That's real good numbers. Better than I, better than I thought it would have. So okay. About how many drives will it support? Okay. It'll support four drives. You can have as few as one in, but you're going to get the speed of one lane. And to reiterate, in RAID, one drive, one lane, two drives, two lanes, three drives, three lanes in RAID. In JBOD, one to one. And to reiterate, can RAID be moved from one computer to another? Uh, you could, but whether they support it or not, that's a different issue. It would need to be exactly the same, apples and apples. So that's something to think about. A Windows machine to a Windows machine. Could you move this RAID to a Linux machine? You'd have to try it and find out. Could you move this Windows RAID to a Mac? You'd have to try it and find out. I, I don't know. I think it might be possible, but I wouldn't bet on it. I don't know it for a fact. Now these questions are based on the ones on Amazon as we went through that, and then I've added some that I have some questions about. My next question is the bridge chip. I want to know whose bridge chip it is, because the bridge chip will tell me everything I need to know about the device. Of the three components, the housing, the interface, and the bridge chip, the bridge chip rules, but we don't know that. And the next question, heat and speed. Okay, four drives individually, we did heat and speed. The fifth test, I didn't expect to be able to see uh, heat, but we did. All I expected was speed, so I'm really surprised about that. So all four, all four drives individually and all four drives in a RAID. We saw that. And of course, the next three questions, which are interrelated about trim support, we saw that. We talked about it. About uh, smart pass-through, we saw that. We tested with that. And then about the control panel, being able to see the individual drives in a software RAID, we saw that, which I didn't expect. We don't have that capability when we do a hybrid BIOS bootable RAID like we've done on the quad cards, which is kind of a bummer on the AMD RAID, but it is what it is. So, okay, with the tests we've run, one more test that we ought to look at. Uh, think of the tests we've run, the five, as being more of a, uh, not a uh, throughput, but a burst mode test. So what I want to do now is take a file like we've done before and copy it from the C drive, which is a Seagate Fire CUDA 520 2 terabyte, copy it over to the RAID partition, see how fast it goes, watch it in real time, and see what kind of throughput we get. Y'all game? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. So we'll close all this out with our stats, and I'll do a print screen. We have some files here from another device, uh, the captured video and then an edited video. And I'm going to take all three of those files and copy them, bring up another of the... Uh, this PC, Windows Flag E, go to the RAID volume. I'm going to do a right click and paste. And let's see how long it takes. This gives us an idea of an actual throughput. Going to take 45 seconds. So we're getting a speed of just under 2 gigabytes a second, which is uh, pretty good for the amount of data we've got. And that's three files, two raw files that come out of the SSD recorder, which are MOV files, and then one edited file which is edited down to an MP4, all 1080 resolution. And this says now we're getting a speed of 575. So below 600 megs, that gets us right about the speed of a SATA drive. But remember, we're going from an M.2 NVMe to another M.2 NVMe RAID array. And the only uh, bottleneck would be the Thunderbolt 3 
connectivity because the drives far exceed that specification. And it says it's going to take about another minute. And I'll go back and double check how much uh, material we ran. We started out at a pretty good clip uh, for our speed, but you can see what we're getting down to. I think the point I want to emphasize with this is to reiterate, any data that you have that you're going to work with, use the GII device as an enclosure for transport. I wouldn't use it as a working drive, but as a storage drive to get from one computer to another. And that's another reason to keep it as a software RAID. And it's going to need to be on the same type. The ideal external RAID would be a hardware RAID, and it should be system on a chip. Something like the other two we've talked about, which would either be the iodine Pro Data or the Blackmagic Cloud Store. 15 seconds, about 5 gigs left. That beats a SATA drive, and there we go. So I'm going to check the amount of data that we moved. We'll verify the properties. And that was 103 gigs of data that we moved in whatever amount of time. You saw in real time while I was talking. So to reiterate, all the other tests were like a burst mode. That last test was more like an actual throughput test. So remember, your results may vary. If you've got some questions or if you uh, need some more input about this device, let us know. We'd like to hear from you. My name is Gil Boyd. This is Builder Bio. Welcome. We look forward to seeing you next video. We're out.